morning first. About to be easy. All right, this morning we looked at a parable. What was the parable about? Lightly. The huh? The prodigal son. Well, where did the prodigal son go to work at after he ran out of money? What'd he go do? Huh? A, a farm. farm. A farm doing what? Pigs. Pigs. Feeding pigs. Huh? Well, no, well, it just tells us pigs. It didn't say anything about horses. Where did he return when he came to his senses? Where did he, when he came to himself, where did he go? When he got smart, where did he go? Back to his dad's house. Where can we go when we come to our senses if we're in a bad spot? Huh? Well kind of who's there though God okay no. can you draw what happened what happened for him when he got home what did his dad do for him he hugged him what else he killed a cow yeah what else what was that why was he killing a cow what, they, what were they having a what a celebration. We call it, maybe call it a party. party. All right. Yeah, they had a big party. It was a dance party. You think they had balloons? Huh? They had balloons and they had fireworks. Like, you don't think they had balloons back then? I think they probably had kids full of hot air, though. You think so? Okay, now we're going to go all the way back to uh, Exodus. All right. Who, who are we looking at? What was the guy's name? Moses. Moses. You study? You study? Moses. Well, what, what did Moses do? Where was he born at? What country? What country was he born in? What? Egypt, Egypt. yeah. <laughs> That he was born in Egypt, and he got, uh, and the Pharaoh said that there shouldn't be any, any more baby boys. So what did, what did his mama do to him? They put him in the river. They just threw him in, see if he could swim. They put him in a, oh, they put him in a basket, and they hid him in the weeds, didn't they? And and Pharaoh's daughter came, and and she found him, and she took him in, right? Then Pharaoh, he gets a little older, and he uh, one day he saw some Egyptians, an Egyptian, an Egyptian soldier, huh? He was uh, well, like one of Pharaoh. He was in Pharaoh's army. He was no, not that one. He's not in that army. He's in Pharaoh's army. So he hit one of Moses' kinsmen. He hit another Hebrew, which that's what Moses was born as a Hebrew. He just grew up in Pharaoh's house. Now, when he saw that happening, Moses went over there and he looked around to see if anybody was looking. And he just hit that Egyptian and killed him. He killed him and t took some sand and, they, and buried him in the sand. Well, the next day, there was two Hebrews fighting. And Moses said, well, why are you fighting each other? And they said, well, what are you going to do to us? You're going to do to us like you did that Egyptian? And Moses was like, oh, they know about that. Moses kind of looked around to see if anybody was watching him before he did something bad. Do y'all ever do, Have y'all ever done that before? Huh? She, no? Have you ever lied before? Mm -mm. What about you, Bran? Have you ever looked around before you did something you knew you weren't supposed to? You have? Thank you for being honest. What did you do? Huh? You beat him? You hit him? 
Did you try to bury him in the sand? No. Sometimes we do that, don't we? We kind of we look around to see if anybody's watching, then we do something bad. But look, Moses did that, but people knew about it, didn't they? Quit. And it, you stole candy. Oh. oh. From the bowl at the house? Was it my bowl? <laughs> it was? Mm. Well, anyhow, so we, but look, they, so he got found out, didn't he? Moses thought he was safe and sound, but he got found out anyhow. So when he, he did that, he took off, he went running. He went up in the mountains. And then lo and behold, he goes across some well, and there was some shepherds there, and there was a bunch of women there that were feeding their flocks or watering their flocks. And he said, <clears throat> Those other shepherds started being mean to them women. They started being mean to those girls. And he said, and Moses stood up and he defended them. He, he, was, he was a man of chivalry. Y'all know what that means? I don't, I don't know what it means either, but it fit really good right there. So they took the, he was, he was going to take care of those women in need, and he, the, he does. And he gets them water when they get back home. And their daddy said, well, y'all got done quick. And they said, well, there was this man at the well. There was this man at the well and we started getting beat up. We started getting bullied and he said, no, y'all stop. He defended us and then he helped us water all of our flocks. He started, he gave us all the water. He got the water out of the well. He said, well, where is the man? Well, we left him at the well. Her daddy, their daddy said, why did you leave him at the well? She said, well, I don't know. So one of his, well, they go back to bring him back and Moses falls in love with one of his daughters. They do. He gives, he gives, he gives, he says, you can take her to be your wife. So that's what Moses does. Moses, Moses lives with them and he, he takes care of his flocks and he begins to watch over them and, and make sure everything goes the way it's supposed to go for his uh, father-in-law named Jethro until one day until one day Moses is up in the mountains and he comes across this bush the burning you know about this already well what was the th what was weird what was the, what was weird though about this bush on fire huh well no well it didn't do that but what was different about it Well, that's all part of the story, but there, what was different about the bush? Um, Have y'all ever seen a bush on fire before? Or a tree, or like pieces of wood on fire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens to that wood after it's been on fire? It burns. It burns and goes away. The bush wasn't going away. It was staying, it was staying a bush even though it was on fire. Yeah. All right, we'll 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 get there and talk about what the bush said and everything else. And uh, y'all guess I got ahead of myself in the PowerPoint. I got reminded I wasn't where I was in that. So y'all want to sing a few songs? The but, Lord liveth. The Lord liveth. You want to do the Lord liveth? Yes. The first verse? Okay. The last and first verse. The what? The last and first verse. The first and last? Well, here, let me make sure I don't miss the words up. Okay. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord
It's good to see everyone out this evening. Uh, we're thankful for your presence at the, well, scene number one.
Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day that you've given us to be able to come out tonight and to worship your high and holy name in song and praise and in study. We're so thankful for that, Lord. We're thankful for safe travels to, to get here and to and fro everywhere else we go. We're so thankful, Lord, for, <clears throat> for your son, Jesus, who you sent to, to die on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of, of sins, Lord, as we're such troubled and imperfect people, Lord. Help us to continue to, to strive to be sanctified by by the word that you've given us and to always try to meet that standard that Jesus has set, Father. <clears throat> pray that you be with us through the remainder of this service, Lord. I pray that the speaker of the hour will have a good recollection of the things he has to teach. Lord, I pray that it would have a lasting effect on us and those who have yet to obey your gospel, Lord. <clears throat> pray that you would be with us through the remainder of this service, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Song before the lesson will be number 243. Number 243. <coughs> <coughs> So, here we go. I want to look at for a little bit with you uh, about this idea of shame and guilt 
and how it feels, what it feels like. I don't know if you have ever experienced shame or guilt following sin or uh, maybe just being somewhere you shouldn't have been. Maybe you, you just didn't want to get caught there. You weren't necessarily uh, doing something, you know, uplifting to the kingdom of God, but you weren't necessarily doing something bad, but somebody saw you there and you were a bit shamed about it, felt a little guilty about it. Uh, you know, we, we hardly ever, as we, in the children's class, we looked at and discussed about Moses his killing of the Egyptian soldier. You know, at the moment in time, he, he kind of looked around to see if anybody's going to see him, but then he, he hit him in the sand, and, you know, he didn't really feel anything about it until the next day when he gets kind of called out on it. You know, that's when the shame and the guilt kind of really sink in. It's when there is a realization that I have done wrong and I have sinned. Because so typically in the moment of sin, we are happy and enjoying ourselves because Satan has twisted sin into pleasing to the eyes or to the flesh or to the pride of life in some state, form, or fashion. Uh, otherwise, there would be no desire to sin. But as we look at throughout, maybe you're not familiar with it or you're, you're hiding it from yourself to put off feeling the shame and guilt all over again. But let's look at Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, remember when, when they were walking around in the garden and they had one rule, they were happy. They were fine. They were dandy. There was, there was no problems. And they walked around without no clothes on. And they, they felt fine about that. They were comfortable within that. And then they, they eat of the forbidden tree. They look around. They find out they were naked. So they go and they make themselves from fig leaves some clothing to try to cover themselves up because they felt some shame that associated with this nakedness. They felt it exposed, so they desired to cover themselves up. They felt some shame. They felt some guilt. And we can continue on in this uh, story looking at that, but we won't. Well, you think about David with Bathsheba. David with Bathsheba and the events that transpired over that, which that is a long, lengthy rap sheet that, that David uh, gets for himself during this moment. Uh, after sleeping with Bathsheba, and now she, he, here she is, she's going to be with, with child, and he's going he's to try to cover it up, and he brings her husband home, and then that doesn't work, and tries to get him drunk, that don't work, and then sends him on the front lines to kill him, and then, okay, now that he's dead, I can now marry her. But here is Nathan who comes to David and approaches him and tells him the story about this rich man and this poor man and how they had many sheep for the rich man and this poor man only had one sheep. The rich man was going to throw a party and he takes the one lone sheep from one little lamb from the poor man. And David said, well, that man needs to be put to death. And Nathan says, you are the man. Well, that's when David felt that shame and that guilt through murder and adultery and passion and lust and desire and hatred. David never felt any shame. He never felt any guilt that is recorded for us in passage. But once his sin is realized and put and thrown in his face, he immediately said, like, I'm the man. I'm the one who has done this. What about on the day of Pentecost? In Acts chapter 2, Peter begins to open the eyes of those who are present, who most likely could have very well been the majority of the same crowd who was there at the Passover in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified. So 50 days later, here is most, most likely a predominant crowd that was the same who were there shouting, crucify him. And they are, they are revealed, it was revealed to them by, the, by Peter and the Holy Spirit that Jesus was in fact the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Being stricken in their hearts, they give this question, they give this reply in verse 37, it says, They are cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Shame and guilt had entered into their hearts and into their minds, and they desired relief. They wanted this gone. They, they didn't like the feeling. So 
so many times we end up like the prodigal son and that I don't need God I don't need the father I want to run away from all of that and I'm gonna go sin and then once we realize that we have sinned, it, I mean, not that we were ignorant of what sin is or that the actions were sinful, but we blinded ourselves and participated in sin, we then become ashamed to repent. And it's a plethora of reasons as to why we may be ashamed to repent, but here's the thing, we're not ashamed to sin or sin again. And time and time again, we feel that burden and the shame and the guilt associated with sin. And that carries us into the point where, you know, I don't want to repent because everybody's going to know I'm going to be admitting my faults. I'm going to tell everybody that I'm not perfect. And right now, I think I got them all fooled and that I am perfect. We're ashamed about that, but we're not really ashamed to go sin again. And Daniel Defoe's well-known classic, Robinson Crusoe, he, you know, he goes to sea to be a sailor against the wishes of his parents, and he began to regret that decision and unwillingly returned home because he did not want to admit that he had made a mistake. He was ashamed to have his friends and family know that he was wrong and his parents were right. You see, it is realized by him and he comes to this revelation that some people are not ashamed to sin, but they are ashamed to repent. We should, however, be ashamed to sin. God's Word describes sin as a shameful action. It is something that should bring up reproach. It is iniquity. It is separating us from God. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 8, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Uh, we should be shamed. We should shame our face. We should hide our face. We should put on the sackcloth and the ashes. We should lower ourselves because we've sinned against you. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 25, we lie down in our shame and our reproach covers us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. So many times we do, we lie down in shame. Our reproach covers us. And when we, when we have this realization that, you know, of where I am, with my sin in my life and the sleepless nights and the tossing and the turning and the, the heartache and the dwelling and the spacing out and wandering off in the distance. Here we are looking, just realizing our shame. Moments where, while well, we're there present in body, but our mind is far, far away because we've not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. God's Word describes this sin as shameful, continuing in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who forsake God shall be ashamed. They shall put themselves to shame. This is a shameful action because they have forsaken God. Sinning against God is shameful. And all who disobey and forsake God's way, they ought to be ashamed. And so many times they're not. Some people, they're not ashamed to sin at all. They're, they're out there, and I'm out here, and I'm in sin, and I'm loving it. Because Satan has grabbed a hold of them and their actions and said, hey, then it's fun. And this exciting, isn't this, isn't this pleasing? Are you not having fun? Oh, I'm having a great time. Yeah, that's why you need to stay in this. You don't need to be ashamed about it. You should be proud of it. We should build you up. Let's start a revival among the world. Let's no longer make this a shameful activity. Let's make this a prideful activity. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15, were they ashamed when they committed an abomination? No. 
they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be cast down. So many in our society enjoy sin and are determined to follow their own way rather than God's way. They rejoice in wickedness and insist to continue to practice it, to encourage others to participate. They ridicule those who are godly and they call them old fogies and boomers and old timers and you just are not smart anymore. Why don't you know any better? God's Word says that all such conduct is shameful and those who refuse to be ashamed of it now will be ashamed of it in the day of judgment. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 3. Therefore, it says this, not in the PowerPoint. Therefore, the showers have been withheld and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead and you refuse to be ashamed. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. The one thing that they're worried about serving is themselves. That is the God that they worship. If it feels good, then I, why would God not want me to do it? If, it, if, I, if I feel better afterwards, then what's wrong with that? If I'm smarter or I know more than I did before, well, what's wrong with that? Maybe you should be, maybe this could be unveiled to you. They glory in their shame and the shameful actions and the things that they, had done, they have done with minds set only on earthly things. There is nothing on their mind of heavenly things. If it was, then shame would definitely be brought to them, but it's not. They're simply here and now living their best life. But we should not be ashamed to repent. Once we feel the shame of sin, we realize the wrong that sin has brought us and how it has separated us from God. Once this realization has come to us, we should not be ashamed to repent. The only solution to the shame of sin and the shame that sin brings upon us is to repent and to serve God obediently. To continue to serve God. To turn away from that sin and to serve Him and Him alone. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 7, Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 17, But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. Rather than the shame of sin, we can enjoy the blessings of forgiveness and salvation when we repent and we serve God. If we turn from our sins and we seek to do the will of God instead of shame, we will feel enlightened, truly glorified, we will feel this idea of everything's good and everything's going to be all right. It may not be all right right now in this moment and it may not be the greatest moment of my life, but I'm looking for something more because I no longer have this shame of sin that really is the thing that enslaves us because that's how the freedom is found and when we're in Christ Jesus there is no longer that shame and that bondage of sin so why are so many people ashamed to repent the main answer and I think the biggest primary one primary one for old Matt is pride pride because by admitting that I've sinned I, I feel like I've let people down I feel like I've, I've let you down. I, I feel like I've let my spouse down. I feel like I've let my children down or, or my parents down. I, I feel like, you know, maybe I've, even I think of the, my relationship with God and I've let God down. And, I don't, and, and, and to repent is to admit all that. To admit my faults. And I have to go tell everyone this. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 18. Poverty and shame 
will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honored. In chapter 11 and verse 2, when pride comes, then shame, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Over in James chapter 4 and verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There are so many that, that need to realize that humbling ourselves will bring us closer to God. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Humbling ourselves, lowering ourselves, to put ourselves into perspective that God is greater than I. I am human. I mess up. I have sinned. I am going to avoid those temptations, and I am going to cling to that which is good. I'm going to humble myself in the sight of God. I don't no longer serve the belly of myself. I'm no longer after earthly encouragement and earthly wisdom. This is about glorifying and honoring God. Like Robinson Crusoe, people simply do not want to admit to others that they're wrong. They're ashamed to admit immoral conduct for which they ought to repent. They're ashamed to admit family problems of which they need to repent. They're ashamed to admit religious error that they need to repent of. They're ashamed to admit that they have neglected to be active within the church. And so many times the barrier is pride and the only thing that can take down that barrier or that wall of pride is to humble yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 beginning in verse 8. We will read through verse 10. For even if I made you grieve with my letter. Remember, this is Paul writing to Corinth in 1 Corinthians. He gets a little harsh with them. Telling them about some of the things they need to correct and fix up and make their life better here in Corinth. So much so that there was a man who had taken his uh, father's wife and so, so Paul has come down on them real hard in 1 Corinthians. Now here he is writing again in 2 Corinthians. Even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice not because, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. death. As long as we refuse to repent, we continue in our sins. And if we continue to refuse to repent, the ultimate result will be everlasting punishment. When if we were willing to repent, we could receive eternal life. And so he is, we have this godly grief that, that should you know, motivate us to repentance. And so that, we could, that could lead us to salvation without regret. Psalms chapter 119 and verse 78 says this, Let the insolent be put to shame, because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let the insolent be put to shame. Let us be put to shame so that we can, by that shame, by that godly grief, be moved to repentance so that we could not be ashamed anymore of who we are because we have changed and become what God would want us to be. In Romans chapter 1, it tells us something that we can be confident in and that we do not have to be ashamed of. Romans chapter 1 in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Do you have sins of which that you need to repent of? You know, here is the gospel of Christ. It, this is the free gift of God that He has given His Son so that, he, he, so that our sin does not have to be held against us any longer. We have been bought, we have been redeemed, we have been purchased, and for that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
Do not be ashamed of the gospel and do not be ashamed to admit your sins so that you can receive the forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ being washed in a watery grave of baptism and risen up just as he was risen on the third day for, 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 so that we could be forgiven of our sins and be a new creature. If you're here this evening, you're subject to the Lord's invitation. We want you to come as we stand and as we sing. to partake of the Lord's Supper that wasn't able to this morning. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we come to you at this time so thankful for this Lord's Day that you blessed us with. Father, this time as this individual is taking their minds back to the cross to remember your, your son's death, we pray that as they partake of this bread that represents your body that they will Take it in a manner that's worthy and pleasing to you. We we'll pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray again. God, we come to you again just reminding of your, your love for us by you sending your son to save us from our sins. Father, at this time, as this individual partakes of this through the vine that represents that blood that flowed on that cross, that they will remember his death and partake of this in a manner that's pleasing unto you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Here, can we lead uh, 839, first verse only? Again, we are so thankful for you being here this evening, and I'd like to invite you back uh, Wednesday night for our midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock, and then next Sunday again at 10 o'clock. Are there any announcements before we close? If not, we'll sing the first verse of number 839, after which Brother, Joel, or Brother Bob Brooks will lead us in our closing prayer. Let's all stand and sing. What's on the divine in so